my great pleasure to have a conversation this evening with Professor Chapel and Mr. Nagraj um, to talk about the global housing crisis, which I think we've we've probably had more than our fair share of headlines in the Bay Area over the last couple of years. Um, we're really going to be looking at the connection between poverty uh, and and housing and what that looks like globally and how it's manifesting its, itself here in our backyard. Um, four areas of discussion this evening. Uh, one, how do we think about the growth of cities, the growth of urbanization, and, and how that uh, impacts housing and equality? Two, how do we think about um, what cities around the world are doing to address their housing problem and how, how cities are trying to become a little bit more equitable in, their, in, their, uh, in building more viable economic centers? Three, what's the role beyond the public sector, so private sector, um, in helping to address these issues? And then four, what in the world does that mean for us here? And what can we learn about what to do and try and what to maybe stay away from as we think about continuing to solve the problem in, in the Bay Area? So let's start big picture. Dr. Chappell, uh, would love to hear, especially uh, given all of your research and, and your leadership of the Urban Displacement Project, about um, how in the world this, this problem manifests itself in, in different areas globally and how different people are thinking about it uh, to set the stage for our discussion this evening. Thanks so much, Shannon, and, and thanks so much uh, for World Affairs for inviting me. Um, so it is the privilege of professors to, to go to the big picture, um, which kind of lets us off the hook. Uh, but it's, a, it's an awful amount of fun. So um, I, I, you know, I want to start by saying that you know, when Bloomberg comes out with its list of the least affordable cities, right? Um, these things come out every year or so. And um, the most recent one had a number of um, suspects um, in Asian areas, Hong Kong, um, Sydney, uh, but also Vancouver in Canada. And then London, of course, shows up on all these lists. And then you get the California cities. So, so we're up there. We're not at the top tier of unaffordability in California. Much That might be surprising, but it's true. And it means that, that we still have something to learn from the, the most unaffordable um, cities out there who are actually doing some really interesting things. So um, I want to start with, with talking about why we're in this housing crisis and how it relates to income inequality more broadly. And there's three kind of big buckets of theories about this. And the first comes from economists. The second comes from urban economists. And the third comes from housing economists. So in the economist bucket, um, you can look at Thomas Piketty, right, and Joseph Stieglitz. And you've probably um, all heard those names. So Piketty is the one who pointed out to us um, that the ones who already own capital are going to do better than the rest of the world. Um, and so the rich get richer. Um, the return on capital is always higher than, than economic growth, generally. Um, so Stieglitz came back and added something really interesting to that. Stieglitz pointed out that actually a large fraction of the increase in wealth is an increase in the value of land. And he and other um, urban, uh, other uh, economists were able to show that increasing house prices um, are really responsible for this uh, return on capital that Piketty had been talking about. Um, and then that, Stiglitz pointed out, was very closely connected with the credit system and the availability of, of global credit. So credit is going nowadays not just um, to new businesses, not just for capital goods, but it's surging into land and the real estate sector in, in particular. And that creates um, bubbles, as we've seen over time and as we're over overdue for um, in, in this country. Um, so, so if you take those economists and what they say we should do, you have Piketty saying we ought to tax, we ought to have to have a progressive tax system. And by the way, in California, we've already done that. We have a tremendously progressive tax system at the state level. Um, and then we have Stiglitz, who points out to two remedies. He says, first of all, we need to deal with land policy. We need to have land value taxes, land ownership. 
um, in the public sector. And then he also talks to about the classic realm of development economists, which is we have to do better education, we have to have better health care, we have to have better transport systems, we ought to have all of these services be free basically. Um, so that's what the economists say. Um, the second bucket is the urban, um, the urban economists. And there you have um, the folks that are really looking at the, the, the increase in regional inequality in the US, both between regions like Boston, New York, San Francisco, um, uh, and the rest of the world, the rest of the US, um, and also within regions. And so uh, folks like Enrico Moretti, talk a lot about um, the high productivity innovation hubs, such as the one we're in, uh, which produces more jobs than housing. Um, and uh, folks like Michael, Michael Storper um, talk more about just how, how these uh, great cities are becoming kind of super metros that attract um, most of the talent, um, a lot of the wealth, uh, the high-skilled uh, workers, um, not, not in a back-to-city movement. I mean, that's part of it, but really because of the structure of businesses um, and technology businesses in particular in these areas. And um, so if you're, if you're one of these urban economists, you're going to be talking about either increasing the housing supply, and that's, that's what Moretti talks about, a lot um, in blaming land use regulation, and we can get more into that later. Um, um, or you talk about having more inclusive housing policies. And so in the third bucket um, is are the housing economists. And I think this is the view that we don't really talk about enough. Um, and planners in, um, in London and Sydney and so forth, academic planners like Nicole Gurren, um, are talking about the financialization of housing as being really a major driver, if not the major driver of, of the housing crisis at this point. And the problem is that the way we've conceived of housing in this, uh, in capitalist countries, right, is that it's not only about shelter, but about investment. People make money off of housing. Um, and so it, the, when we're talking about how to solve the crisis, we need to think about how to manage that investment side. And that's really hard to do um, because there is a global housing industry. There's the, the national credit industry. And so you have this combination of, of household credit plus speculative global investors that want to mess with your housing market no matter what you do, right? So how do you manage this demand? And in the US, we don't do it very well, or the UK for that matter. We, we tend to have policies which support the market. We don't restrain the market. Um, and then other folks can take advantage of us, folks that do restrain the market. So what? why do we have a surge of global investment in housing in this country? It's partly because of places like China. China has a uh, policy called purchase restrictions. It doesn't allow its residents to speculate in housing in China. So what do they do? They speculate in Sydney and London and San Francisco. And so you know that that Chinese investment is is 34 billion from 2008 to to 2014. So that's a lot of money coming in um, to 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 our global cities and. Um, this is, makes it impossible for us to really build our way out of, out of the problem if the problem is investment from outside. Um, so that's the big picture. Thank you. Yeah. Would love to take it a little bit more local now. And um, Adi, would love to hear about, you know, we've just gotten the picture laid out for us. This has been in the works for a while. Um, why is the problem feeling so acute, especially here in the Bay Area now? And maybe you can offer us some perspectives as to what's been in the works for a while and, and why it's coming to, or it feels like it's coming to a head today. Sure. Well, thanks for having me, um, Adi Nagraj, Director of SPUR. Um, how many folks live or work in the city? If you just raise your hand. Okay, great. So um, the city is just endlessly fascinating to me. My in-laws were in town and we're having dinner at the Castro, and I was at Union Square, and I had like 20, 30 minutes on my, on, my, on my schedule. So I walked from Union Square, kind of went into the Tenderloin, and like I'm sure you guys have done that walk, and it's the dramatic shift of income between Union Square, the Tenderloin, and then the Castro is mind-boggling. Um, and I 
feel like that is a microcosm to kind of where we are right now, mm -hmm. certainly in the region and in the country, that income inequality. I, I was in college in the late 90s, and the narrative in the late 90s where cities are falling apart, we've got to increase investment. There was this um, article that Michael Porter wrote, the professor from Harvard Business School, the competitive advantage of the inner city had him, you know, it was like the images of the graffiti on the New York City subway. And I just was thinking as I was walking to dinner with, for my, to meet my in-laws, like we've come a long way since those days of how to spur investment in low-income communities. And then also reading a Wall Street Journal article recently about opportunity zones and the Fresnos and the Clevelands mm -hmm. of the world and what to do with them. Mm -hmm. So we're certainly on the, on the extreme of, um, of wealth here. Um, and I th you know, this disparity is, is so multifaceted, as you all know. Anyone who walks around the city, you'll both see the Salesforce Tower and you'll see homeless folks um, lying in the streets. Um, there are a number of kind of major factors that, that we look at that we're trying to combat. Um, I put them in different buckets. There's zoning, um, there's costs of housing, and there's sources, uh, the lack of sources of housing. Um, our zoning laws in the city are really, really restrictive. 54% um, of, our, of our parcels in the city can only have one or two units built on them. Um, and for any, uh, if you want to build a six unit building or more, 87% um, of the city is off limits to based on current zoning, which is why you see much of the multifamily development going on in Soma, Tenderloin, Mission Bay. It's really kind of aggregated in certain parts of the city. Um, so we have done a very good job of preventing new supply from coming online. It almost, it, it, if you're a city council member or a board of supervisor, you almost have every incentive to not approve a housing project because you have the folks who are going to vote for you or against you, you know, you're going to run into them at the Safeway the next day after a tough vote, and those are the people that are going to get upset that you voted for mm -hmm. something. You have the recipients or the beneficiaries of the new housing that are not there yet. They're living, they're out of town. They might be in, in you know, four people to a one bedroom um, because of our housing shortage. So you have all the downside and none of the upside. You're, we're fiscally not incentivized. Um, building housing, the property tax valuation is limited because of Prop 13. Plus, housing is expensive to run because you need police and fire and schools. Um, it's expensive to kind of maintain new families living in your communities. Mm -hmm. um, office buildings, hotels are easier from a fiscal perspective from a city's um, point of view. So um, a, a council member has every reason to not do it. And it is wonderful when courageous leaders, whether they're city council members, Mayor Breed had a pretty um, energizing speech at City Hall when she was inaugurated, saying that we need to build housing on all sides of the city. Um, kind of, I think, tipping her um, knowledge, at least, that, that where development happens is very one-sided in San Francisco. Um, so there are a number of obstacles um, on the zoning front. Um, the, the California State's Environmental Quality Act is, um, while it has certain laudable principles of um, measuring traffic impact and noise and kind of environmental impact. It is, um, it is a much more aggressive environmental regulation than any state that I've seen, and, mm -hmm. and, and you might have different information. But other kind of good, you know, um, tree and animal loving states around the West Coast um, don't have the egregious um, or aggressive levels of regulation. And though that means that it's really expensive to go through that process, which when I was at Bridge, there would be developers who would say, hey, do you want to team up on a project? And we would talk from out of town, from out of the state. We would talk them through the CEQA risk. Um, and you need to put up money that is at risk, because if it gets voted down, or if you don't get CEQA approvals, then you know, you're, you're losing out on the 500K or 800K that you advance um, to do all the studies. And that is um, that was essentially too rich for many folks' blood um, who are not used to such an expensive, high-risk system. So it limits the number of players who can build, which, of course, means that housing is, is harder to come by. So zoning is a really big category. It's super hard because people get very protective of their homes and their neighborhoods. Um, there was an article that I read where a number of people in a focus group said that they, they like housing, they um, don't mind if their neighborhood changes, but they don't like development. So in my mind, it was like, housing is good, development's bad. <laughs> um, and so we're, we've created a system where it's very hard to get new supply line. That's one. Um, quickly, costs are really, really high right now. I had a, um, 
kind of a real estate economics consultant in San Francisco, tell me on Friday that inflation, inflation adjusted, this is the most expensive construction market um, that he's seen in the last 25 years. And that's probably true going back before 25 years ago. Um, so the cost of construction, the cost to build is incredibly high. He was saying that we're at about maybe, you know, per square foot is what contractors work on. So between $400, $450 per square foot um, in terms of dollars per unit, the mayor's office of housing will see applications that run just for the hard cost, 600K, 650K per unit, just for the hard cost. And then all in with all your soft costs, you're up to 800K or 850K per unit. And then land acquisition is on top of that. Um, so just the, the cost to build is really high. And there are a number of reasons why people speculate mm -hmm. that that's happening right now. Um, and then lastly, our sources to build. The federal government has certainly, compared to the 60s and 70s, has abdicated their role in helping to um, uh, expedite development or at least alleviate the housing shortage in a lot of cities. You know, the New York Times will have another article about the um, NYCHA, New York City Housing Authority, and all the troubles that they're in. The San Francisco Housing Authority went through a lot of troubles several years ago, mm -hmm. which um, enabled Forrest Mayor Lee at the time to quote unquote privatize the public housing to essentially transfer them from the housing authority, which was on limited dollars to the tax credit housing system to, and Bridge was um, a, part, a heavy participant in that, to allow nonprofits to build and operate because the flow of cash coming for nonprofits through our tax credit system is essentially much more robust and predictable than the public housing system. Um, and certainly in San Francisco, we, we are very generous with our pocketbooks in terms of voting for new bond measures for housing, um, but they just frankly don't yield the number of units that we need to um, have them yield because okay. of the time duration, the cost of construction, and then all the environmental risks. So those are, without the feds involved, we are forcing the state and the cities to play a bigger role. We're almost forcing this, this cat and mouse game between market rate developers and, and uh, nonprofit developers or um, kind of subsidized community, low-income housing community to fight with each other about how much low-income housing can you, market rate developer, afford to build before your project is infeasible. And, you know, and there's, there's distrust that often develops. So we're doing a lot more infighting, I think, than we used to mm -hmm. because we don't have the federal help that we once had. So those are the challenges that I see locally. Which I think tees up very eloquently um, the need to learn from others. Dr. Chapel would love to hear, especially as we think about those I don't know if it's an honorary list we should consider ourselves on or not in terms of not being at the top tier, but learning from others who have gone through this. What are some of the things that you have seen work effectively in those high cost cities like like the Londons of the world, the Hong Kongs of the world that may address some of, of the issues uh, we, that were just highlighted? <coughs> So I want to start by responding a little bit to what Adi said, um, because there's absolutely nothing he said that I would disagree with. Um, <laughs> everything is on, on target. What I disagree with, actually, is the overarching narrative that he just presented, that we need to build, um, and we need to figure out how to build more housing in San Francisco as the solution to the problem. So. Uh, I, I would argue um, that, yes, absolutely, we need to build. <laughs> However, there's a lot more to it, and that's where we can start learning from other mm -hmm. cities. So, so the issue with building our way out of the problem is, is first of all, we're, we're building a lot. Because we have the surge of global credit, um, global investment, we're building a lot at the very high end of the market. We're building the types of units that would never trickle down, um, and it takes 35 to 50 years anyway to have trickle down work. So that new supply um, doesn't do the job. Um, and then here's, here's the hard part, and this is what I think Michael Sturpe is such a genius at, at pointing out, um, that when, when we build new supply, we're just attracting more people. Um, and so it, there's basically infinite demand for housing in San Francisco. And not only that, we're such a high productivity uh, region, and for every new high-skilled job that's created, or uh, every 10 job, new high-skilled jobs that are created, you typically eight people come from outside the region. So that puts 
high school job creation puts a huge amount of pressure on, on the local um, housing market. So the more we build, <laughs> um, the more we put stack in housing near transit, the more we're going to have folks um, saying, oh, we can move to San Francisco after all. Let's do it. Um, so, so yet, yet, <laughs> so that if you, if you don't build, um, those folks, um, some of them are still going to come and they're going to take your houses, right? They're going to take the houses that your kids would have bought. Um, they're, they're, so that's where we have this kind of displacement effect because we don't, buy, don't build enough. So you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. <laughs> um, so it, it, this is where you start to think, well, maybe this is not really so much a housing crisis as, a, as an income crisis. And I think that's where other cities have really um, gotten, this, gotten this right or, or doing, doing better. Um, so, um, so, it, it, so policies that really address issues of income inequality at the very low end by, by focusing on education, healthcare, and transport, as Stiglitz would have us. Um, but but more specifically, I think the, the, the policies that I am most excited about are those that are using tax measures. And Vancouver, in particular, is the example that I get really excited about. So Vancouver is a place um, that is, is taxing foreign investment. It's making it, um, there's a 20% tax on foreign home buyers. They started with 15% tax, went up to 20% because um, it, it was so effective and they wanted, they figured that they could do even more. Um, then, then they've enacted a speculation tax, which is, is going to come uh, later this year um, to target folks that don't actually pay income tax locally, that don't live locally, that are just warehousing units. Um, and um, then, of course, they have an Airbnb tax and, and so forth, a number of other measures um, that help preserve um, some of the housing supply, some of the existing housing supply uh, for locals. So I, I think we really have to, to look towards these tax measures and then also kind of shift our focus or, or increase our focus, because I do think we should build, but to also preserving um, housing units, uh, existing affordable housing units. That raises an interesting question around the, the, the populations that are being impacted. And, and I think there's a, a common connotation that affordable housing is for low income or vulnerable populations. And when you actually think about the magnitude of the problem, 1.6 billion people globally lack adequate housing, um, thinking about the fact that they're, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know, a city of San Francisco s school teacher right now is paying 50 to 60 percent of their take home pay in, in average housing costs. How do you think about the populations that we should be focusing on, especially because there is a variety of methods or measures available to us and a variety of people who need support? Um, so I think, uh, well, a few things. One is that I have to <laughs> respond, of course. Um, you know, my view is that people are moving here regardless. And I certainly, I was fortunate enough to buy a place a little while ago, but I was that renter who was going to a open house to a one bedroom and had my rental resume and there were like 30 people there with the same thing and with their check and ready to compete with me. And um, I, you know, people move here largely for jobs and then they'll kind of figure out the housing later. And of course there's a tipping point after which there's a pain where you will go elsewhere. But my view is that um, the, the more we restrict, the more we keep things the same right now, um, and we're increasing job capacity and folks are moving to, uh, or there are companies opening up in Silicon Valley, and of course Silicon Valley is not building, which is hurtful to us. Um, we are getting people to move here. Um, I don't think San Francisco is immune from supply and demand laws. Mm -hmm. um, just this month, rents are have tapered off. They're a little bit lower than they were recently because um, the market is tapered. There's new supply coming online. So I think the 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 best thing we can do for apartment owners is to not build anything more, and then their limited number of apartments become more and more valuable as more people move here. Um, I also think that we're so reliant right now on impact fees from new construction. New construction pays for parks, um, muni in the city, mm. um, off-street improvements, and we do have an inclusionary program here, um, which is 
not working well for a number of reasons. Um, I, I do think that we need to um, have some kind of robust system where we essentially can promote new construction um, and try to extract whatever benefits we can. Um, and I also think that there's a lot of supply that is not necessarily, quote unquote, luxury. Um, I'm a part of a missing middle working group that's looking at parts the western side of the city. What does building um, a, up to the 40 foot height limit, but having multiple studios or one bedrooms in like the sunset of the Richmond, what could that look like? How could that be integrated architecturally to the existing fabric? Those are not, you know, $4,500 per month one bedrooms based on the market studies that I see over there. Um, so I do think because we've been forced to build so much in this like mm -hmm. little corner of the city that we're in right now, our mind is skewed as to what a new market rate unit looks like. And um, there's, there's right now multifamily market rate units going on in the Excelsior, some in Viz Valley, and then hopefully one day on you know western side of the city. And I do think that's a very different price point than we offer in this kind of corner of the city. Can, um, we, can, I, can yeah. I pick up on that thread? Because I, I think a little bit of this gets to the, the income equality, how people choose to live, and again, this kind of um, juxtaposition between how do we continue to be a robust, competitive economic powerhouse, as well as still be a place that people love to live, work, and play in, whether you're a transplant or someone who's lived here for 30 years. In all of this, what do the role of the employers, who are those economic, the drivers of the the uh, economic powerhouse that we're becoming, play in solving this problem? Um, in paying for some of the things you just talked about in terms of impact fees covering, and a, as well, um, Dr. Chapel, trying to think about um, tax incentives and and other things that can come from perhaps new or different sources and have historically uh, been used. Um, sure, I can start. Go ahead. Um, yeah, you know, we're, we have so many housing wars in the city that that is the housing developers are the population of people that we go after. Um, and there is, of course, so much impact from the huge amount of job growth that we've had in the city. Um, it's hard for me to, there's so much frustration in the city around, around street cleanliness and the really sad homeless issue um, that San Francisco as a city to live, work, and play um, I don't know, part of me doesn't care that we have such robust economic vitality if I see people who can't afford to live in homes sleeping on the streets or, um, or drug behavior or unsafe behavior going on because um, there are companies that are here, there's money that's kind of going through a system that we don't see and then it spits out some public improvements on the street or a really beautiful Golden Gate Park. Um, but then there's so many, you know, but then like Muni is never on time and BART always stops in the tunnel and there's so many problems mm -hmm. that we, encounter every day. Um, so it's, I feel like there is kind of a newer conversation with all the new corporate money that's in here about what is the role, what is the role of tech right now. Um, I was sharing some thoughts earlier that there's like the generation of Gap, um, Schwab, Wells, kind of older San Francisco firms um, that have been in this town for, of course, decades. And then there's this new generation of the sales forces, sales forces and Facebook now with their new building and Twitter um, that are coming online um, at the same time. And there's a, certainly some kind of causal effect of the impact that they've had in the city, driving up rents, limited supply, and people are getting squeezed out. Um, I, I, I feel like there's an openness from a lot of these companies to have a real conversation about this, to be totally generalizing and not a scientific study. Um, the, the tech folks that I'm in conversation with they tend to be younger, they, a lot of them tend to be renters, and a lot of them acknowledge that they're kind of newer entrants into the city and frankly feel a sense of social responsibility in, in um, helping to address these problems. They're, uh, they're suffering from having problems figuring out how to grow their workforce because it's really hard for their employees to live around here. Um, and, and I mentioned it before, but they're really frustrated that a lot of the South Bay is just not building and that's exacerbating our crisis mm -hmm. here. Um, so what that looks like, um, you know, it's really hard to, we don't really have a robust system on how much should Salesforce pay in community benefits for occupying that building. We just haven't evolved in those conversations like we have with housing. Um, so I think there is certainly an opportunity to do it. Um, we had two propositions in San Francisco, sorry, last point, and then Bye. I can kick it to you. Um, Prop C and D. Um, uh, in June, uh, two, three months ago. 
and Prop C was a gross receipts tax on, on office landlords um, to fund childcare, and Prop D was a gross receipts tax on office landlords to fund ho homelessness and, ho and housing. Um, it was, it became also a little bit of a proxy for the mayor's race, which got, you know, which made things complicated. But essentially the child care measure passed, the housing measure did not pass. Um, uh, there is now gonna be a measure on the November ballot um, initiated by the Coalition on Homelessness for a gross receipts tax on any corporation who makes more than, f who grosses more than 50 million per year. And that money would go for homelessness services. Um, so, there are, there's the advocacy community that's really frustrated about this income mm -hmm. inequality that we all see. There's the business community that um, I think sees this endless trough or uh, this endless attempt at grabbing taxes with kind of no big picture, no end in sight, and no clear understanding. The, cities of, the city and county of San Francisco has an $11 billion budget um, and per capita, it's hard to tease out because we're a city and a country, but per capita, it's certainly one of the highest in the country, if not the highest. Um, you know, how have we gone from six billion to 11 billion over the past several years and where's that extra money going? So they, they have their own frustration. So I think there is a challenge, but also an opportunity to have a more healthy dialogue between the factions of the city. Um, I want to go back to a point Adi skimmed over, which I think was really important, which is about impact fees. Um, and uh, a practice which really hasn't been that successful in San Francisco, even though um, many are very proud of it, but that's taxing development. Um, because it's another factor, um, whether we tax through impact fees or through inclusionary housing, it's a, it's, a, it's a factor that makes it very, very expensive to build, and we do still have to build. Um, so, you know, I think we should rethink how we do our taxes, really, to, it, to focus perhaps on the gross receipts tax or time to talk about a tech tax, and I hope Spur um, takes that on for San Francisco. Um, so, um, but then think about this, putting this money into housing trust fund um, uh, that San Francisco has already, um, and then spending it um, in a way that can get the biggest bang for your buck. And, you know, there are a couple kind of easy things uh, that this money could go towards. Um, it, it, it could go towards San Francisco's already successful small site acquisition program, which buys buildings and keeps them permanently affordable um, for perpetuity. Um, or it could go towards um, homeowners and help them build ADUs, accessory dwelling units in the backyard. Or it could go towards apartment owners that want to convert some of their parking um, into other units. Um, or it could go towards getting more modular housing um, in, in San Francisco. Um, but I think we need to be much more strategic about how we think about building affordable housing. Because remember, our policies are built are around a time in the 1960s and 70s when affordable housing was just for, for poor folks and working class folks. Now affordable housing is for moderate income people too. We have a middle class housing crisis and it makes us have to rethink our, our foundations of housing policy. Can I, can I just jump in with two sure. things? So on that last point, um, that's right. Um, God, and, I, and so the, the tax credit program was created in 1986, and that's right now the primary way that we build low-income housing. Um, I was looking at the numbers today. So when you get an allocation of credits from the Treasury and you sell it to a Wells or a B of A, or fr frequently it's a bank because they want the CRA credit so they can pay more for the, for the credits, um, you are, in exchange for selling the credits, the developer and owner can rent the units at no more than 60% of area median income. So I look today and 60% AMI for a family of four in San Francisco is um, $88,000-ish. So family of four, so that is, let's say, two parents and two kids. Um, that means each of the parents can make no more than 44 k to live in the highest income of low income. Um, and you know, for a single person to make 44 k in the city is ridiculous. And so we, we have had applicants to bridge developments who make 
you know, a, a couple that each makes 48K or 50K, and they're told that they make too much money for low-income housing. So we do have this um, system that was built around, like, the presumption of a housing ladder mm -hmm. that, of course, doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is this middle-income population that is missing out. The really difficult political conversations that we have um, because the money is unfortunately finite and the expenses are high, is, hey, at least that wage earner making 50K has more options than the wage earner making 30K. So we do need to prioritize that 30K person over that 50K person. And those are the hard conversations that happen at, at City Hall. Um, and then just one more quick thing on inclusionary. I think Karen's right that um, this method of extractions is, um, it's really, it, it doesn't work. Um, it's, a, it's a good model that, you know, developers can enter into a formula, hey, for this many gross square feet, I pay this much to the MTA, that much to schools, et cetera. Um, the way that the inclusionary policy works is that there was this kind of grand bargain two years ago um, where the controller's office working with um, independent consultants who were looking at cost of construction and rents everywhere in the region, uh, everyone in the city two years ago, said that developers right now can afford to pay between 14 and 18% of their, have 14 to 18% of their units be low income on site. Um, and that number was derived with consultants, controller's office, and a technical advisory committee made of political appointees. That number then went to the Board of Supervisors, and the Board of Supes said, all right, we're going to take the high end, 18%, and tick it up 1% per year until the year 2025, when it'll be 24%. So that was the, that was the thinking back two years ago, I believe. Um, since then, what's happened? Construction costs have dramatically escalated. Rents are steadying and going down a little bit right now in San Francisco. And 19% just doesn't work. It just is not feasible. It's too high. Um, and so applications to the planning department have plummeted. And um, as Karen alluded to, the city of San Francisco, their, their schedule of getting in-lieu fees is plummeted as well. So there are all these great groups like Bridge and TNDC and Chinatown and Mercy proposing these really cool projects, and the city is saying, that's great, we like it, but we actually don't have money right now. Um, so there's kind of a, a generation of projects they can fund, and then the outlook after that, the cliff really falls off. Mm -hmm. So that is what happens when you take a good idea and extend it too far, is um, feasibility is no longer available. But that, that, that mm -hmm. population of who are housing is so hard. Because I will say that low-income housing tax credit system it's really good. Like you actually, you you sell these credits, and right now the 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 value and the demand for these credits have has decreased slightly because of the um, reduction in corporate tax rate at the end of last year. But you know, you get millions of dollars of equity. You get a long term um, limited partner in the partnership that mm -hmm. owns the development, and these are sophisticated players like at Wells or B of A. So it's it it can be a really good system when it works well. It's just that the top tier of incomes is very low. For San Francisco. We've had a couple of questions, really thoughtful questions from the audience, so thank you for that. And um, one of one of the themes here is um, the the impact of nimbyism, not in my backyard, um, and uh, this this uh, this uh, need for being pro housing, but potentially anti development, especially if that development happens on your block or on your neighborhood. Um, would love to hear Dr. Chapel around how other folks have maybe addressed NIMBYism and effectively in other places, that, um, uh, how that might have worked, or um, things that you see people starting to do here in the local area that have been effective to start making some movement around, again, not in my backyard, but okay, maybe I'm starting to think about it, maybe on my block. So this is a really hard one because if you Google NIMBYism, you'll see articles coming up from the entire world at this point, yeah. right? <laughs> so um, so getting around it is, is really hard. Um, the, the, I mean, I think we need to think a little bit more about the scale at which we make land use decisions. And this is something, this is a reform process that's going on in California, which has let home rule kind of rule the day, um, despite the fact that housing markets are regional, economies are regional, transport systems are regional. So why are we making decisions mm -hmm. city by city? It makes no sense. Um, gradually, I think the state will move more to take, uh, to, to, to um, 
change this system of local control so that then you can overcome some of the nimbyism. Um, but it's a long-term um, battle. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, um, I, I chair the Oakland Planning Commission for two years, so I lived a mm. very bicoastal life. Um, <laughs> I will say that the, the um, you know, they're kind of intellectually easier examples of nimbyism to think about because they're egregious and they really are a fear of who's mm -hmm. going to come to your neighborhood. But um, they're also really hard ones. Um, there is um, there were a series of Oakland proposed developments um, in 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 an area kind of near Lake Merritt that was both close to Chinatown and close to the, and, and close to the Black Arts District. Um, and so, really hard questions on. Um, on, hey, you're going to take this really crappy parking lot and turn it into really nice housing. And yes, this I mean, it's kind of the debate that we were having. Yes, it's great. Your helping supply is probably good for the region, but it really sucks for my building right next door. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to have more concessions from the developer. And then you get into the black box of pro formas and what can the developer afford. Um, or, hey, it's great that you're going to build on this parking lot, but um, just because all the smart growth people say you need to have a low parking ratio doesn't mean that that's what's best for the business for the small businesses in my community. So great that you know spur and transform and everyone's saying 0.1 parking ratio into transit, but what do we all do? Mm -hmm. um, so those are really that's that's a form of nimby, nimbyism that's really hard. And when you get a group like Chinatown activists or African American artists coming, you can't like very vulnerable communities. You can't just say. Pro supply, you know, you know, you've got to have, you've got to try to facilitate as healthy a conversation that can happen, mm -hmm. knowing that ultimately we 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 all, I think we all want to see the building get built, but we want to make sure that the community process is robust and all these things have been talked about. So I think if um, there's one, um, specifically one commissioner on the on the Oakland Planning Commission, Jimmy Myers, who's now the chair, um, who really helped shift the a lot of the dialogue and a lot of the expectations for market rate developers who are going in to need to engage in robust community dialogue. Now, what is robust and when is it too much and when do negotiations turn to extractions? You know, that's always the really hard mm -hmm. part. But um, I do think that there needs to be a high level of discussion because every little neighborhood has their own little need. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the nimbyism is really easy to identify and sometimes it's really difficult to deal with the issue at hand. Yep. Thank you. Um, some other questions around, you know, how we think about uh, policy and uh, tax uh, tax uh, incentives, especially when it, when it comes to being um, prescriptive around the type of investing and who can do that investing. Uh, the Vancouver example uh, that you brought up, Dr. Chapel, um, and how do you balance? the need uh, to help put controls in place potentially with the other side of, of that policy uh, that could have discriminatory effects or be perceived as discriminatory as we think about who gets to buy or sell what. So yeah, I, I think this is a really important issue. And um, I, I guess my simple answer to it is as long as we are targeting the 1%, we're not discriminating. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> so that's the question is do, making that target explicit enough um, so that we're getting those folks and not the folks that are trying to climb up the economic ladder. Anything to add? No, that was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, a bit of a uh, kind of a holistic question or a few f few questions here around how we think about um, the impact of real life for regular folks, if you will, and the choices um, people in especially the Missy Middle in San Francisco and the Bay Area more broadly have been making to just move farther and farther away from Job Center, take on more burden in terms of uh, transportation cost, both in the cost of actually getting to work, parking, as well as time in, in cars or commuting. Um, and what that actually means in terms of where we should be targeting um, targeting new homes, or how to think about other short-term measures to uh, uh, positively impact the wallet of folks who've already made the choice to move out of the city. Hmm. Boy. Hmm. Um, 
uh, boy, that's really hard. I mean, it's hard because right now the most robust system we have to build low-income housing is the one that I talked about, which mm -hmm. bills it for the very low, uh, or you know, the the 60% AMI and lower. Um, there are some policy ideas that I've heard talked about that are you know incremental in their approach, but could be interesting. One is to um, New York has. And New York has a lot of different models than we do, and it's partially because we, in terms of property taxes, so much of our property taxes is dictated by Sacramento, more so than theirs is dictated by Albany. But um, developers there can, um, in exchange for building a certain amount of affordable housing on site, um, they can get property tax rebates for you know a certain number of years. Um, that is not a system that we have. So basically, you know, the the more affordable housing you have on site. The, the lower your net operating income is, the less debt you can leverage to build your building. Um, and the way that New York kind of deals with that is saying, hey, for X years, I think it's 15 years, you don't need to pay property taxes, you get a rebate. But we're going to certify that you're building these and your income certifying the people that are in the building. Um, those are kind of tools that municipalities could or should be able to use to draw more of the middle income folks to live on site. Um, it's really, you know, if you're a market rate developer building 100 units, there are so many cost efficiencies of building out your affordable units and taking a tax rebate on them. So I think that would be an awesome opportunity to explore. Karen mentioned that, I mean, there is a lot more activity in Sacramento now when it comes to cities, and I think certainly partially because Scott Weiner and David Chu and folks who are very familiar with our crisis are um, now able to see what they can dictate from Sacramento. Um, the other, the other. Um, rule that's kind of making its way through the process is for the tax credit system, as opposed to capping out at 60% of area median income, your highest renter, um, there may be a rule where your um, your average can be no more than 60%. So you can actually have some 80 or 90% people on site, but you also need to have 20s or 30% on site. So it creates a bit more of a dumbbell effect within your building, but you're incentivized as the bridge or Mercy or Chinatown to have 80 and 90% workforce, true workforce people living in your building. Um, again, that's a hard conversation because that unit that's going to a 90% AMI person is not going to a very low income person. Um, but those would be the types of trade-offs mm -hmm. that I think we could have more discussion about. Great. Um, another question around uh, how we think about sources of capital or how to put that capital to work is almost the inverse of, of selling tax credits that we've talked so much about, but rather putting power in the people's hands around an expanding voucher system or something to that effect. Um, perspectives on whether that's effective or not effective as a policy lever and, and if there's been any examples of, of really making that work in other places. Well, it, I so I mean the issue with the voucher um, approach it's been true for for thirty or forty years since Reagan pushed it is that mm -hmm. you're relying on the market then to produce produce the housing and then in, in practice the issue has been that you still don't you have landlords that are then not willing um, to accept the vouchers because they have the choice whether to or not. So um, I personally am more of an advocate of, of income-based approach of universal basic income or other types of uh, 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 approaches to, um, re you know, rather than relying mm -hmm. on the market to provide that affordable housing. Yeah, and I'm, I'm seeing the same thing that the the voucher level you need to commit to has to certainly be above market because the landlord otherwise is just incentivized to take anyone um, off the private market. Um, partially, it might be due to you know negative stereotypes they may have, but also there's a ton of paperwork that they have to do. It's a, it, it can be a pain in the ass administratively, um, and so it just is frankly easier to get someone who is not affiliated with like a government program. You know, San Francisco, one of the many kind of homeless. Um, interventions that they, that they do is quote unquote rapid rehousing, where if someone kind of falls on tough times, gets evicted, that there is a, a subsidy available, and whether it's through the city, I know that um, Hamilton Families is participating in this as well, where a family can get um, a pretty fat voucher for a certain number of months. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those folks are not able to make that work in San Francisco. So they are moving, and it's not Oakland, Berkeley, it's you know to the far East Bay mm -hmm. or Contra Costa County um, in order to find a unit 
that'll take their subsidy level because it's so much over market. Um, so I agree, there, there are real challenges. I think as an idea, it's a really great idea, but I think when you get down to implementing it with landlords, it becomes very difficult. I want to be thoughtful about the, the time that we have remaining tonight. And we, we've spoken about a number of different uh, ways to impact this issue. If you had to leave the audience both here and virtually with a thought on what they could do to positively impact the housing conversation in their neighborhood, what would you recommend? Um, so I, I would um, have you all, um, first of all, vote, and <laughs> secondly, vote for progressive uh, candidates that are really thinking about these issues broadly in terms of income and tax and uh, land policies uh, that are going to keep San Francisco affordable. Um, I think it's really important to r realize that San Francisco should be completely gentrified. And it's not. Half of the units in San Francisco are rent protected in some form. And, and whether that's public housing, subsidized housing, or, um, or rent control, we have layers and layers of policies in San Francisco already that have actually worked. <laughs> So I think one of the things we need to think about in San Francisco is how to how to keep those policies working because a lot of them the housing preservation policies and the housing um, the tenant protection policies are a little bit outdated and there's a lot of work to do to make sure that they can um, accommodate the the current housing crisis. Great, thank you. Um, I would say. I mean, there's so much happening right now at City Hall about this issue, and um, you know, it's it's easy to say go go and go and fight like hell at City Hall, mm -hmm. but you know, a lot of it is um, um, participating in the discussions. Like supervisors do listen to people who fill out speaker cards, um, and their staff listens to them. And so, whether it's kind of smaller stuff like Home SF, this um, program to try to build more density on the west side of the city, kind of within existing kind of height envelopes. Uh, more complicated stuff, like trying to get more modular, low cost modular housing built in the city. Um, if, if the new mayor is gonna look at building more temporary shelters, um, you could imagine that they're gonna be some, for um, homeless people, you could imagine that they're gonna be some tough neighborhood conversations about where those go. And those homeless people who are right now on the streets need a voice for someone to um, help help them get shelters up there. Um, so there are a number of ways that, um, oh, and then the last one, a big, a big thing in San Francisco that we're beginning to work on is San Francisco is the only major city in California that has quote unquote discretionary review where a building permit is discretionary. And so that means that Bridge or TNDC can kind of go through planning approvals and then get a building permit and that building permit can be appealed. Um, and that adds a lot of cost and a lot of time. Um, and that's written into the city charter. Um, so there are a number of ways where um, advocacy and education and showing up at Board of Soups meetings or at land use committee hearings on mo every Monday um, could help change the narrative around accepting housing in our city. And I would also say, God, we do need a lot more, we need a lot more development in Silicon Valley, um, Brisbane, South San Francisco. Um, I do feel like San Francisco is a, a kind of a good actor in this where we all get together and we fight, but at least there's a desire to do our part to fix things. Um, and that can't be said for all communities around the Bay Area. So we could also use your help in amplifying this issue there as well. Great. Well, before we open the floor up for discussion with those of you in the room, I'd like to say thank you to each of you for joining us tonight and for the variety of perspectives and topics you covered. Um, and many thanks to you as well, audience, for your terrific questions.